God bless you, saints. To God be the glory. We are here with his word, and it is a great day to be in his presence. Move a little bit in his kingdom, advance it, crush the enemy, take authority, and all those things that we do each and every day. So I welcome you here today. Thank you for partnering with us as we go forth in the remote parts of the world. And as we get started in today's message, let's pray. Father, I give you the praise and the glory for this message. May all who hear, hear. All who have ears to hear, listen. We thank you, Father, that we are coming to you today to be transformed in our minds, to be rejuvenated in our spirits, and go forward in your word. We give you the praise and the glory for these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And to God be the glory. What can I say? I'm going to get into something that's actually quite funny to me now that this has happened. So here's the catch is this, is that... Your body cannot go where your mind hasn't been. Every single thing begins in the mind. You have to recognize the starting place is in the mind. King Solomon tells us that sin begins in the mind. Now, today we're going to get into a training of the mind that will help you to be aware and to be looking and thinking and moving in a new way. So today I'm going to give you 10 truths about focus. Now, truth number one is that your focus directs your path. Now, when we turn to the book of Philippians, and we can also look at the Israelites while we're on our way to Philippians, but I'm going to show you a couple things here that... When you begin to see this, you'll begin to see it, okay? And the, the Philippians 4, 3.14 is what I have written down here. I hate it when my pages get stuck together. 3.14 tells us this. Now, remember, your focus directs your path. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Okay, which means in order to get the prize, you have to be on the path, right? Because the prize is along the path. Now, we say, okay, well, what path am I on? Where is my focus? So I have to have a focus to get to the path and then get on the path, and then stay on the path, okay? Now, what's interesting about this in totality is that when my students come in, I teach 300, 400 level classes, and they have an idea that, that graduating from college is the goal, and they said, but what happens after that? There's no plan beyond that. So they get there, but then they don't really get further, People have a plan to get married, which is great, but what's your plan for staying married, okay? So the, the focus that you have will direct your path, okay? So we see here what he's telling us, though, is I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we stay on that path that will direct us where we're going, and we have to be aware when we're on the path and then discern when we're not. Okay, so when I look at the Israelites, they were they they didn't know. They really just didn't. They they were given so much plunder, and they just imagine carrying all around what they were given, <laughs> just hauling that around for forty years. Like that's a long time. And, and so there's a way to not be so burdened when you get on the path and keep focused on the path. Those of you that have a straight, narrow path of where you're going, you have to remove every single distraction. Because if you don't, your focus will be removed, and the moment your focus is removed is the, is the moment that you're not there. It's, all, it's estimated on average that for every, every distraction takes people 20 minutes to get back to where they were in their train of thought. 20 minutes, that's a very long time, 20 minutes to get back where you were working. So we have to recognize where we're at, what we're doing, how we're doing it in every way. But we have to be recognizing that our focus directs our path. Where's your focus and where's your path? Put the two together, the right focus on the right path gets you to the right direction in the name of our Lord. You could write the vision down, know it, see it, move there, and you will get there. Truth number two about focus. It determines 
your emotions. Now, one crazy lady in the Bible, and we're just going to stick with one. There's a lot of bad girls in the Bible, but we're just going to stick with one. And she is found, and it, there's some crazy men too, keep in mind, but we're just going to pick on um, a mini cool opportunist, so have no fear on that. But we're going to take a look in first, first um, Kings, and it is 16, and it is all about the woman of Jezebel. Do I have this correct? Ahab, and maybe it might be Second Kings, but you know the story of Jezebel. And when I look at Jezebel, that was, that was the wrong one there. When I look at Jezebel, oh, maybe that's why. Let me find the first king. <laughs> Where is she? I know she's in here because I have studied her at at nauseum, we may say. In the Kings, however, you all know the story of Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was, was a crazy woman in the fact that her emotions moved her away from really where she needed to be operating, okay? So when we look at Jezebel, she was the wife of King Ahab, okay? And so here we are with, with this, here we go. I'm going to start right here because this is one of the things that, that I want to show you is this, is that in, in 21, 1 Kings 21, there was an incident in, in, involving the... That's not what I'm looking for. Why can't I not find it? Ahab. Yes, it is. I'm in the right place. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it takes me a little minute to get there, but I will, and I apologize. My nose is a little runny today, but I rebuke that. But here's the deal. This is kind of interesting. In twenty, in in First Kings twenty-one. So I want to start here in in sec in verse two. Ahab said to Naboth, "Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth." But Naboth replied, "The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors." Well, wise man, right? We're not going to give up that which is for our children's children or our legacy. So. Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. His wife came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? Because I, I just said to them, and he tells the whole story, and, and here she is. Now, she lost her mind in overstepping all of her boundaries, her emotions took over, and in the end, she was killed by a pack of dogs. I'm going to bet they weren't pugs. However, in the being, being taken out by a pack of dogs, the, the issue here is that her emotions were ruling her. You will lose your focus if you are ruled by your emotions. Okay, and this is a hard thing to overcome is the flesh. And in the book of Romans, it tells us those who are ruled by their flesh are not pleasing to the Lord. Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay, so when we begin to see Jezebel just had a thought. Now, her husband's sullenness was, was his problem, not hers. But like she was, she just overruled, let her emotions get involved, took over all these things, created all these problems based upon her emotions that really should have just been taken control of. Had, had Ahab been more like Job, um, she would have acted more in order because Job would have taken authority or Job did take authority of her house and Ahab, over, over his house and Ahab did not. So when we begin to look at what our emotions are being ruled by, well, that's a big deal because there's so much that will that is that is moving in a way to cause people to be ruled by their emotions. Now, and it's second it's second Corinthians ten. But I want to tell you this: those of you that that know of someone, because it's probably not you, that have addictions to social media, it is known that that one of the larger social media platforms when they first created the platform they contacted and and hired those that work in vegas to 
to create all their algorithms that were based off of slot machines to keep the people addicted. So they had these algorithms built in. Everything was this nice color of blue, except the notifications area was red. That would draw your attention to it and it would move you away from being calm to that area. People click on that area and then what did they do? They've got the notifications when someone is typing, you see the blue little dots and then people would get engaged, get engaged, get engaged and then their emotions trigger anger and that's exactly what they thrive on. Many have left working for these platforms because they are seeing the outcome of what is happening to their to the people that use it. Now, I have a friend who's a chiropractor and he has said that there there's certain responses he can see from those who have social media addictions and what it does to their bodies because he adjusts people in their physical body for a living. And, and he finds that those that sit too much, those that are addicted to social media, that their bodies start to respond and react in a very different way. So the emotions need to be controlled. Now, what are we told to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5? It tells us this. First of all, in verse 4, it tells us the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So if you, if you are out of order in your mind, your emotions, and these other areas, then what is controlling that? Now, it can be food. It can be medications. Many people are all into the pharmacy that is controlling their emotions and they're not really aware. And many, 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 many other things. But it tells us this. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Why? because it will control your emotions. If you do not get your mind when your emotions together coupled to be of sound mind and you're running by your emotions, your mind will then start to follow. Your body cannot go where your mind hasn't been. The minute something enters into the mind, then the body starts to react. I remember years ago interviewing um, a detective in, in Michigan and and this detective found that 87% of perpetrators of rape, they watch pornography before going and, attempt, and, and raping their victims. Their bodies could not go where their mind hadn't been. It all began in the mind. This is why the porn addictions are the hardest addictions to get rid of because of what it does to the mind. And the mind and what it does within the chemicals within the brain start to release throughout the body and then the body starts to respond. It's easier to get rid of the other types of addictions that go into the bloodstream versus those that attack the mind. The mind and the emotions are so big that if you're going to focus on the right things you've got to start tearing down these these strongholds get your mind in alignment and be getting your emotions in order you're gonna to have to tell your emotions look get in order you need to get in order and start telling your emotions how big your God is and not crying to God about how emotionally <laughs> problems you have right so we see a bit of a difference here but we can recognize that to stay focused will requiring getting control of your emotions the moment that your emotions are op excuse me operating is the moment that you've lost this is why king solomon also gives us warning don't do stay away from the hot-headed person many people will say oh they're just italian they're just they're just irish whatever those things are and there are some 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 generational things within the cultures that are strongholds however setting all that aside your emotions must be in order period so you can focus anything that causes an emotional breakdown just gets you off track of where you're going you'll lose your focus if you get emotional doesn't matter what the emotion is in order to be moving forward your focus is determined by your emotions get your emotions in order your focus will be enhanced now uh, truth number three is that your focus reveals your wisdom. What's interesting about these two groups of people, one is, is what's interesting about Solomon is this, is that he prayed for wisdom in a dream. I find that pretty awesome. Okay, so Saint King Solomon knew enough to know that he did not have what was necessary for him to do what was necessary. Okay, so when we look at what happened here, he says that in verse 3, 
of, actually it's verse 5 of 1 Kings 3. So 1 Kings 3, 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. How awesome is that? Solomon answered, you've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued his great kindness to him and have given him a, a son to sit on the throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great peoples of yours? So, other versions, it's wisdom. Your wisdom determines your focus or reveals your focus now solomon knew what he needed he knew that he needed wisdom to lead the people i mean he was i think 12. <laughs> imagine that like that could you imagine going back to age 12 and i welcome all 12 year olds if you are 12 or remember the day when you were when you were 12 praying for wisdom like that's pretty awesome, right? To be to be praying for wisdom to govern God's people and and know that you need it in a dream. Okay, now you might say, yeah, but it was in a dream. It doesn't count. Uh, sure, it does because God answered. So so when I read that, studied that years ago, I started praying that God, whatever I need, I asked I asked that I have a dream that I can ask for it all and get it and remember it and that you'll answer it. Thank you in Jesus name. <laughs> Like, there's some, if Solomon asks for wisdom in a dream, I'm going to ask for dreams, for dreams of wisdom, and wisdom in my dreams, and dreams and wisdom, all while I'm going everywhere. Because, you know what, I just, I'm just ignorant. <laughs> well, what do you, what do you, I mean, what do you want? It, it is, it just is what it is. I just am. I mean, I know that I need a lock for my catalytic converter because people are stealing them, but even still, because there's precious metals in them. But, you know, I don't know how to install one. Kind of, Do I need to know that? I mean, there, I just need to know this. You know, this is kind of where my focus is. So um, there's a lot that I don't know. Now, here's a few other people that just didn't quite know a lot, too. So your wisdom, your, your, your focus reveals your wisdom, and your wisdom reveals your focus. Because the more that you grow in wisdom, the less you will be entertained by the stupidity of the world. Because let's just be clear, the world is pretty stupid, which it would be if they're rejecting Jesus, because only a fool in his heart says there is no God, right? So we start to see, wow, some of this stuff makes no sense, but it really does. That's the funny thing. Now in, in 25, that's Mark, I want Matthew. Matthew, Mark. There are these 10 virgins. And what's crazy against these ten virgins is, is their level of wisdom, okay? So in this parable, check this out, okay? At that time, this is 25 in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So you need lamps. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. I wonder if they had a conversation about that collectively. <laughs> There's a lot of things. Were they like not in that text in that text thread, you know, that bring oil, or did they individual were they just individually this uh, foolish or were they we know collectively they were right but was there not one of the I mean really okay so five they were just foolish but they didn't take any oil okay so what good is that's like that's like driving a quarter with with less than a quarter of a tank of fuel and expecting to drive a car across country <laughs> now the wise ones however took oil in jars along with their lamps well yeah hello I mean this is this is no different I'll give me an example of this okay Real life, real life example. So, 
my students at one particular college were preparing to be on the PGA and they got to go through rigorous exams and there's a lot that goes into being on the PGA, the Professional Golfers Association. There's a two and there's testing and there's a lot of rigorous things. So I started asking my students, at what point does your game um, start to go the wrong way? Especially in the Texas heat, there's certain things that happen. What hole do you start to have a problem? Because there's always going to be a place at time that something happens. Well, what happens at that time? Well, I get hungry. Okay, so what protein do you have with you? Oh, what water do you have with you? I mean, it's hot in July in Texas. I mean, it's just what it is. So some of them reflect the five foolish virgins because it never clicks to them to take water, to take the, to take the, uh, the ice packs. So they, they have like little, not squeegees, but whatever the chamois are for around their necks that cool them off or extra foods and proteins that doesn't melt. So then that way, whenever they start to feel that energy loss, they are rejuvenated. Okay, this is just, we may say common sense, but common sense isn't so common. So we pray for a spirit of common sense. And so, so I started explaining to them, we got to see where exactly and start pinpointing it. Because then you'll know before that time, you need to do something. Because if it's a whole nine, right, and you're playing 18, and it's a whole nine that things go down, then you need to start eating it a whole eight. So that way you can get through. But if you wait till whole nine, you're probably going to mess up whole nine and whole ten because your body's going to need to acclimate from what you just gave it if you were on schedule. So there's certain things that happen to all of us. Okay, so when I look at some of these things, I just kind of laugh because these, these, these women did not know how long they were going to be there because it's evident here. And some took oil with their lamps, which means they were prepared. Okay, this is no different than today, me telling you in a couple messages ago that, you know what, the, the rations of food are happening all around the world, and you need to, you need to stake heed to the word. We've been given the word since 2018 and earlier. It's not just, oh, well, it's just maybe, no, it is happening. So we can't be foolish like these foolish virgins and then expect that our neighbors are going to feed us. That's not going to work. Don't come to my house because the answer is no. And don't go to, if you are wise, you're not going to allow that anyway because then they eat all their food and kill you. And then you're just done. Like, these things happen. We have to be wise. But these foolish ones, they didn't do anything. Foolish ones took their lamps, no oil. The wise ones took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. Now, how long is a long time? <laughs> how long is a long time? I mean, this is like, you could be overnight waiting for it all to start. You don't know. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. All of them. All ten of them did. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no. There may not be enough for both us and you. See, I got my go bag. Do you? No. There won't be enough for both of us. So now you're just a leech and a mooch on the system. Instead of being responsible and doing what you should have done and shown up prepared, you just slacked, you were ignorant, you're foolish, you didn't do what you should have done, and then you're going to come and think that you have the right to take mine. Like these entitled, these entitled foolish women are just something else, right? So, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Okay. Do, 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 do. But while they were out on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. See, there's a timing of every single thing. If you're not walking in wisdom, you're going to be missing things. And I'll get to these things in a moment. But there's a timing. Your wisdom will help you. Mm. Your wisdom reveals your focus, reveals your wisdom. There's an order of things. Jesus did everything in order, all in a level of focus, to do something on his way to doing something for the betterment of everyone. Huh. The virgins, the virgins who were ready went in with him. Oh, but while they were waiting, the oil of the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Later, we don't know how later, and we don't know how long it took for these women that could have been on path to get off the path, 
really they were never on the path because if they were on the path they would have walked in wisdom and brought the oil but they didn't they didn't see it they weren't focused they they did not think ahead they did not plan through any contingencies whatsoever they had no plan at all <clears throat> lord lord open the door for us but he replied truly i tell you the truth i don't know you Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. This is why, this is why, like, you got to keep watch. And I find this, this scripture, keep watch. You don't know the day or the hour. So you need to be living like today's the day. Today is the day. Today is the only day that you've been given. Rejoice for it is a day that the Lord has made and be glad and rejoice in it. Woohoo! <laughs> See, but, but here's the deal. If you just are, are not aware it's kind of like going into a grocery store and having no plan and being hungry. And then you come home and you bought a bunch of stuff that you didn't know that you bought. I mean, I've done that. I remember I bought a chicken at Costco, stuck it in the microwave when I got home and then forgot I bought it. You can imagine what that was like when I opened up the microwave a week later. <laughs> I was bad. Yes. They're good. It smelled good. I bought it. I forgot. Yeah, and I don't use the microwave that much. So, you know, lesson learned. Don't do that. See, wisdom reveals your focus, reveals your level of wisdom. Pray for wisdom because she will meet you with the gate and keep you on that path of, boy, do we need wisdom. Okay, so that is, that is number three of what wisdom reveals. Or what focus reveals. Now, number four is your focus decides your future. Your focus decides your future because every everywhere you go determines the next step. Your success is found in your daily routine. What is your daily routine? Like, what do you da do daily? What are the things that you do? You'll know. Just just start looking at, at what you do with your time. Where are you going? What are you doing? How many hours in the Word? How many minutes of hours do you pray in tongues? What are you doing with your time? Well, I don't have to. No, it's probably not that you don't have time. It's that you're not making time. The time is there. There's 1,440 minutes in a day. You can either invest them, waste them, or spend them. What do you talk about? Your focus determines your future. Every single bit of it. Okay? So when, the, when Jesus said to the disciples, follow me, change their focus, change their future. Change their focus. The fool in his heart says, there is no God. He made a determination of his future. Oops. <laughs> there, there. Oops. <laughs> Turn with me to Psalm 119.37. Psalm 119.37. Your focus determines your future. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Turn my eyes away from worth, worthless things. Why? Because those worthless things will multiply and they will rearrange your focus away from the things of God. There'll always be another football game to watch. There always is, right? There always is. It used to be, what, Sundays, and then it was Sunday twice, and then Sunday evening, and then Monday night, and then Saturday, because you got college, and then if you're in Texas, it's high school, and high school football is televised. And so now we've got, and then they had a Thursday night, so Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, all day, because it's college, and then Sunday, all day, and then Monday night, like, and what do you get out of that? You know a bunch of stats and watch men run around in tights. Okay. <laughs> Where your focus is determines your future. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Your word. Focus in here. That is where your success will come from. Your success comes from the ways and means and operating in the Lord. The ways of the world will do nothing but distract and destroy you and divert you away from the things of God. So your focus, if you have goals, you need to write them down. What does it tell us in the book of Habakkuk or Habakkuk? Whichever way it is pronounced. Correct me either way. That's fine. I can receive it. And so within that, Habakkuk 2, it tells us, write it down. When you start writing it down, what it does is it makes you from going here to here. Now you can start to see where you're going. The path becomes narrow. When I was in college, I had a, a goal of becoming a tenured professor. 
Anything that was not in that direct goal, I rejected. I was offered great jobs right out of college, graduating college, age 20, offered, offered positions in management positions, regional sales directors starting at 45 grand a year with the vehicle, with all of the stuff that anybody would ever want in sales, opportunity to make, da-da-da-da-da. So I started asking, well, do you offer tuition reimbursement? Because I knew where I was going. I knew my, I knew my direction. I knew what the end goal was. If they didn't, it didn't matter how much the salary was because it would take me away from my direction of where I was going. See, it didn't matter that I was sacrificing then because I really wasn't because the bigger picture was that I could get my education now and be done by 28 with the full PhD and everything else and be moving on. See, but had I done all this other stuff, it would have taken a lot longer and then the devil's real sly in all these things. So your decisions determine your future. Where is it that you're going today? Today determines what you're able to do tomorrow. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. No, you won't, because if you're not willing to do it today, you're going to put it off tomorrow, not do it then either, because you have more stuff to do tomorrow. I could just deliver this 10 truths about excuses, because we all know what they are, right? So your future is dependent upon the choices that you make right now, and your focus to make those decisions is where will get you where you want to go. Your focus determines your future, what your future look like. Maybe Farmville isn't the greatest thing. And it probably isn't. I don't know. Do people still play Farmville? I mean, I found it funny that people would take care of fantasy cows. I mean, they probably try to outlaw them too by 2024. <laughs> so, your future is decided by your focus. Now, the five, truth number five is that your focus does or doesn't bring you to a closer relationship with the Lord. Okay? It does or doesn't. Where you go with the Lord is based upon your focus. There's access to the Father, but see, there's levels of access. And if you don't get beyond where you are, then you won't get to know the deeper things of God because those deeper things of God are for those that are focused in on getting there. Now, in the world today, there are less geniuses in the world because the one thing that geniuses have in common is the ability to focus. Our society now, and check this out, okay? You want to get to the deeper things of God, it's going to require you to, to, to steal your mind. And, and what's happened now is it used to be, and, this, and I'll just speak here for America for a moment. It used to be that a TV program that was an hour long at one point was 56 minutes with four minutes of commercials. Then it became 42 minutes because people, they were adding more advertisements. Then they were adding more commercials in. So now the average one hour program is down to 36 minutes because they keep adding in more commercials because people's attention spans are decreasing. I've heard it before where people say, your messages are too long. And I will say, I will increase, pray for your increase of your attention span. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean by any means, but what's happening is that we don't have the capacity to sustain sit still and listen. Well, you know, I got this to do, this to do, this to do, this to do. Yes, and you're probably not even listening to this at the one thing. You're doing five other things at the same time, which means you're really not focused on the, any of the one things. Studies continue to show that people who multitask actually get 25% less done because they're never 100% focused. If you want to go to the access, to deeper access in the things of God, you have to set everything else aside. You have to still your mind, and you have to sit in his presence and not move. Is that challenging? It surely is. However, where else are you going to go? What else are you going to do? See, well, I got this to do, this to do. Yeah, you got to go chase all those worldly materialism possessions and this and this and this. Yeah, and the devil will make sure you continue to do that. It's just a great ploy. He will keep you in a loop just like the Israel lights. 40 years, 40 years, 40 years, 40 years, 40 years. Complaining that God's not doing this, but yet you never get still because you're trying to access God while you're on your iPhone doing blah, 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 blah. And God's like, well, you're asking Alexa or Siri when you could be asking me and I would show you the greater things, but you don't have time for my greater things. Why would God pour those things into you? See, so in the book of Matthew 6, we really have a problem, if you want the honest truth, because, because our conversations have become so shallow. And if you are, if you are one that has, has people in your life that you can talk about the greater, deeper things of God, you are surely blessed. Because most people don't have that, and I get the phone calls of how deprived that they are, that even in their circles, people that claim they're Christians have no desire to talk about the things of the Lord. They're so consumed by, by the world, and it's like nails on a chalkboard. 
And you know what? That's just religion. It's just a surface. God wants to draw us deeper. In the book of Matthew 6, starting in verse um, 24, recognize this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, most greed, most lust of the flesh all begins in the spirit of mammon, and mammon may not necessarily be dollars and currency or dinar or, or rubles or rupiah or what is called currency, okay? If you are making the things of this world which you are chasing, you're missing what it's really about. And, and that's a problem because where your heart is, there your treasures are. So your focus determines the level of access that God grants you. So if you claim that you want to know the greater things, the spiritual things of God, but yet all you give him is an hour and a half at church on Sunday, well, you'll get an hour and a half type of relationship. Did you know that at least in America, that the average couple, married couple spends 21 minutes together a week? 21 minutes. That's it. And that's in between taking their children everywhere. No wonder why the divorce rate is so high in and out of the church. We say, we say we value these things, yet do we? Look at our life. Look at our society. Consume, consume, consume. We need to be creating, creating love, creating healthy relationships, creating depths within our lives, and not just so placated on the outward plethora of whatever it is. So if you want the greater, deeper relationship with the Lord, it will require focus. It will require that you move all the distractions and you set that time aside. And the devil's not going to like it. Keep aware too, your spouse may get jealous. It will be warfare. And it will be what it is, but as you overcome it and you get to that place that, look, Monday nights from 7 to 9, I'm in prayer. And as you move in that direction, I take no calls, kids, you're on your own, here's dinner, I am with the Lord. And you already have those things set. Singles, if you're, if you're single, then that's different. You're gonna, you, you have more, as Paul talked about, you have more abilities to do things for the Lord because you are not caught up in, in having an assignment of a spouse. So really there's no excuses if you aren't with the deep, greater, deeper things of God. That's not God's fault. See? So we're not divided in our responsibilities, but we're recognizing that our focus determines where we go with God in the depths of our relationship. And I remember seeing, seeing this, this counselor that I know many years ago. And, and what's interesting is in a conversation with him, with he said, well, you know, God's okay if you just spend seven minutes a day with him. And I just thought, what a sad relationship that would be if that's all he, we think that he's worth seven minutes like really like we give more time to to reality tv than the lord what's your life look like where your heart is your treasure will be also your focus determines your relationship and the depth of it with the lord Reason number six, the truth number six about your focus. And this kind of ties in to, to truth number five, but the enemy will disrupt your focus to destroy your future. Now, we already know the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, okay? So, so long as he can disrupt your time and your energy and your focus, well, then he wins, right? But check this out, Proverbs 4.27. It's warfare. Focus is warfare, okay? I, I find monks fascinating for that exact reason. Like, they're just so still. I, find it, I don't know if I find it boring or peaceful. However, where they get to is quite fascinating. Proverbs 4.27. Do not turn to the left or to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. The enemy wants to sidetrack you from any focus of the things of God. So long as he can hold your attention, he wins because your focus is lost. It doesn't matter if it's for a moment. A moment is a win in the eyes of the enemy. Okay? How do you, how do you waste a year? You start by wasting a day. How do you waste a day? You start by wasting a minute. 
You want to know where your year is? Look, it's right there. You wasted it. If you, if you say, where did the time go? Well, you can look at your calendar and see where the time went. We don't really need to have a, have a shocking analysis of it. You see it. The enemy wants to steal every single thing that he can. Oh, well, you know, I just have time to kill. Why are you killing time? It's killing you. <laughs> see, we got to move away from, the, from these things and start really recognizing life is really short and it's time to start living and start getting in the things of the, of the Lord while you still can and while he's found by you. Now, <clears throat> it's also in going back to Matthew, Mark, Matthew 6, is it 6? Mm. No, it's Matthew 4. Or mm. oh, okay. Jesus, is, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Matthew four it helps when I read out of the right book <laughs> and the right verse. I'm learning. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's God that tests the enemy that tempts. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You don't say. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Even Jesus recited scripture. Okay, so that's, that's a lesson for us all. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you were the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your feet against a stone. Interesting too, that this is also in Psalm 91. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, left him and angels came and attended him. Okay, so here's the deal with this. The enemy did everything he could to steal and disrupt the focus of Jesus. But Jesus, now check this out what Jesus said. I do and say only what my father told me to do and say. <laughs> Demonstrated here, right? Resist the devil and he will flee. But what happens is if you are not focused on the things of the Lord, you're not resisting the devil, he won't flee, he'll just squat. And you got to evict him. He just will come in and he'll stay and he'll entice you with a little bit more and a little bit more. Did the devil really, did, they, did the Lord really say? Oh, did the Lord really say? And you're like, hmm, yeah, never hurt anybody, right? All these things, right? So we know the devil's agenda to steal your focus away from the things of God. All he's got to do is set it up. See, many people spend their lifetimes blaming God well, or blaming the devil. The devil's not your problem. You are. You just need deliverance. Hello. <laughs> it's incredible to me how often the devil's always a scapegoat. And it's like, no, you're not fat because the devil made you that way. You're fat because you eat Twinkies all day. Like, that's not even a thing. Come on. It's not even a holy thing to just blame the devil. You just don't want to take responsibilities and put the Twinkie down. It's a thing. And Twinkies, those of you, if you've never had one, don't try one. They're not good. I don't even know if they're food. But the enemy will tell you otherwise. He will tell you how great they are and all the things. They have a shelf life of a thousand years. And so the enemy will move in and, and keep you distracted, will keep your focus disrupted so that you never get to the things of the Lord, which is why you've got to be disciplined. You've got to be so disciplined to be moving in the things of the Lord so that you stay there. Okay? Because if you don't get there, you never will. And it requires effort, and you've got to get yourself there. Why? Because God's got a future for your life, and you can't live it doing, being distracted by the enemy. It won't work that way. Now, turn with me to the book of Romans. Now, another truth. This is, this is uh, truth number seven.
What you focus on begets itself. Truth begets truth. Love begets love. Negativity begets negativity begets negativity. Romans 8, 5 starts us off with this. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. So, talk about negativity. Hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit more. And if you talk about anything negative with other people, they're going to outweigh your negativity because they're negativity and they know a worse story than your story, right? And so then it's like, oh yeah, and then can you believe it? I called this customer service and they did not speak in a way that I could understand. And you know, I've had that experience too. And you know, these people, I just tell you, they keep doing this and this and this and this. Well, you know what? My husband, sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, sister-in-law said, this is what they're doing. And can you believe it? I cannot. And then it's, you're just... Next thing you know, an hour is gone. Everyone's complaining about something. Y'all need a nap. And you got nothing done. And the enemy's just like, yeah, well, negativity begets negativity begets negativity. He tells us here, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those conversations start, I end them. Have a nice day. I'll excuse myself from the restaurant. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. You know why? Because that's where life is. Life begets life. Death begets life. It's kind of obvious, but think about everywhere you go. What do the people around you talk about? And does it drain you? And then it takes away your focus. You came into it feeling great, and then somebody commented, Ooh, I don't know if that I feel in your dress. I don't know that you need to feel it anyway. I'm feeling great in it. And then next thing you know, your focus is all changed. And then it begets itself. And they think on these things. And then they multiply. And you know what? They multiply to divide and never multiply to multiply. The enemy is a divider. God is a multiplier. So when you look at how you are operating after your focus has shifted, well, you have to really recognize that. Because it continues, the mind governed by the flesh is death. Well, yeah. Hello. So negativity begets negativity is all death. See, so when you start to say, okay, I got to clear my mind, clear the mechanism, clear the mechanism. What are we going to talk about today? Do you have people in your life that aren't interested in engaging in the look? Get away from them. You just don't have time. Now you might say, but I'm married. Well, we we'll just pray. It's a little bit different. I'm not advocating that you just go divorce your spouse. That is not okay. We're not saying that. But you get the idea otherwise. right? You will know someone by what they talk about, and I've shared this before. So where your focus is when you're going on the, and the higher things or seeking the higher things of God, there will be less people going with you. Why? Because they want to stay focused on this stuff down here. Well, you don't have time for that. You're going up here. The enemy will try to distract you to be looking down. But let me tell you something. People that are looking to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Everest, they're looking up. They're not looking down. Why? Because there's nothing behind them. They're going forward. They're going up. You are going up. It will require different level of focus, different level of pressing in. You will not be able to get to the greater things in low level carnality. It just will never happen. And the enemy counts on that. That's why he's not really interested in a bunch of churchgoers that do nothing. They're not a threat. <laughs> it's only those that start advancing God's kingdom that are a true threat. So praise God. If that's you, you're like, hey, that's me. I'm getting up and I'm doing something. Yeah, the enemy doesn't like it. Okay, it's warfare when you start to be moving forward to press in. So it gives us a warning here. The mind, <clears throat> the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So if you want to be pleasing to God, you have to get out of the carnality and be moving by your spirit. As you move by your spirit, you're going to be directed on your path. You're going to be overriding your emotions. They won't be overriding you. You'll be moving in a level of wisdom because he who is wise controls his household and everything in his mind. And his mind is, and his body are all in unison because we know in Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together if they're not in unison? Well, Lord, I ask that the God in me is in agreement with the God in you and that the me in me is in agreement with the me in me with the God in you. So that way there is full peace so that every step I take is anointed under you and that I am brought forward to the greater things of you and not distracted by the ways of this world, that my future is in you and I'm deciding where I'm going in you to walk with you for all my days. So you may have to train yourself to get there. 
and it's and it's that self talk that when we look at when we look at King David when we look at the prodigal son they said to themselves you don't want anybody to steal your focus Matthew 634 why because it changes the energy your focus determines your energy Matthew 634 when you are moving in the things of the Lord, your energy changes. Your mind is transformed. This is why we speak the word, because there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in God's word. That is why I speak the word. Now, you say, well, you know what? I find sometimes when I read the Bible, I fall asleep. Well, yep, that's a true thing. That used to happen to me all the time. I could wake up from a nap and open up the Bible and fall asleep for another three hours. Like, hey, how that happened? Oh, very easily. I got to change my energy. So what I start doing, I start reading the Bible out loud. Now, I remember the day that somebody came to my house and like, I just heard, I, I just, I, I heard something and I just didn't want to ring the doorbell. I was like, well, thank you very much. You still could have come in and I would have read the Bible to you. <laughs> they didn't come in. They left to praise God. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> Matthew 6, 34. Here's what happens. See, the focus changes your energy. Now, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So you seek God and everything else comes with it. Seek, seek everything else. God doesn't come with it. Everything comes with God, but not God comes with everything. God only comes with God. See, you want the things of God, you need God. You're going to get the things of the world. God's not obligated to come with the things of the world. You seek him last. He's not in that. Oh, no. Hey, oh, no. Why would he be? You seek him first and all things come with you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. The day will worry about itself. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. Each day is enough trouble of its own. Well, praise God that I can only deal with today. I mean, today just has enough. I mean, really, just to get here today, it's like we got a battle to get here. And in the early days, let me tell you something. What would happen in the early days with all these messages? Now, you've all seen all of, now you hear all of, she's sleeping, praise God. But there would be a time, if I'm in the middle of a message and I'm 40 minutes in and she starts fussing, I'd stop the message and start over. You can imagine how many hours it would take me to record a message. And now it's like, this is what it is. We're going to keep the energy flow. We're going to be moving in the things of God. We're not going to worry about those things because getting the message out is more important than a dog having a little issue. So when we look at where our focus is and our energy is, what are, you, what are your energy cycles? When are you most alert? When are you most not alert? If you're not alert, then what you do is this. If on the, at the time that you're not alert or a little bit tired, don't read the Bible. Speak the Bible. Get up. Read it. Read the Psalms. Walk around. Walk around. Take your dog on a walk instead of just letting your dog go out and come back in. Take your dog on a walk and read and, and play the word, speak the word, sing the word. You know what will happen? You won't be tired anymore. Your focus will be changed. Your energy will be changed. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We are now applying the word, having the word overwhelm us, live in us, upon us, through us. Amen and amen. If your energy cycles, know your energy cycles. I get more done at certain times. Okay, so I know that there are certain times for me that I'm not as alert. So I don't do the really strenuous things at that time because it's not the best for me. I study and I get a lot done at night. Why? Because there's no distractions. I had to train people that I'm available for certain times during the day. Because if you text me or call me after these times, I need, I need to know that everything is still so I can get done what needs to get done. That's where my energy needs to be in this particular time. Okay, so your focus determines your energy. What are you focusing your energy on? You want energy? Shift your focus. Shift it to here. Start speaking it. Play the worship music. You will find a transformation in your life. And now if we stay at 633, let me just tell you this. Your focus will tell you the rewards that you will get. Okay? What does Matthew 633 tell us? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So that's truth number nine about focus. Where your focus is in is there your rewards are. Focus on, the, on kingdom things, well, the rewards come with it. Focus on sin, well, the consequences come with it. You just get the whole meal deal when you sin, just like you do when you live in righteousness. So which meal deal do you want? Just supersize it, brother. <laughs> come on, Lord, let's supersize this one. Amen and amen, and I will take all of them in the name of Jesus, and I thank you that forever my eyes will be up here see the rewards come with where you focus 
You want peace? It's right there. You just have to get it. You got to take these steps to purpose yourself because it's not going to happen by accident. See, Jesus did not die for you on accident. He did it on purpose to free you. You want peace? You got a purpose to get it because no one else wants you to have peace. They're not going to help you get it because they don't have it. <laughs> They're not going to help you get what they don't have. They're going to do everything they can to keep you from getting it because you they know, oh, well, she gets, but she gone. <laughs> oh, no, you got to, you got to do everything you can. So where you, where your focus is reveals the desires and your rewards. Where are you going? Where are you going? And finally, Philippians 4.8. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians 4.8. This is fact number 10. 4.8. Finally, brothers, this is it. You have the power to choose your focus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things things. Oh, yes. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. You have the power to choose your focus, period. Well, you know, I get so many distractions. Turn your phone off. Put it on. Do not disturb. Stop, stop checking your phone all day. Well, they might, yeah, they probably will call. You have the power to train those around you. You have the power, and your only obligation is to be pleasing to the Lord, not to be for everyone else. Have a family meeting. Huddle up with your family and say, this is the time that I'm not available. And even if you do this, here's another strategy, and I've shared this with, with some couples and even with some students of mine. I say, here's, here's what you do, okay? On your way home from work, if you're stressed from all the traffic, when you get in your, in your driveway, hold on, I have to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Instead of getting out of your car, drive around the block once or twice, decompress, or pull the driveway, <laughs> and decompress. Cut off the soul ties from the day, remove the familiar spirits, pray for peace, and then enter into your home. You have the power to transform that atmosphere. You have the power to do all these things. You have the power to focus on these greater things. You have to get creative with the solutions that you bring forth in how you operate, okay? And as you begin to see this, where, where your thoughts are, there you will go. Your body cannot go where your mind hasn't been. You start thinking about this, 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 this. Rebuke it. Maybe you take a different route home from work. Instead of taking the direct route that has you seeing every single restaurant that you don't even need to eat at. It's all deep fried. Maybe it's chicken. I don't know. Maybe you take a different way home. That it's peaceful. You might have speed bumps and not lights, but there's less people. More peace. You get to enjoy the beauty around. You see the, see the yard, so on and so forth. So you're not compounded by all of these things. Life is already moving too fast. What are you focusing on? You choose your focus. And you have the power in the name of Jesus to do so. So your focus determines your path. Your focus determines your emotions. Your focus determines and reveals your level of wisdom and it decides your future. It determines the level of access that you are given by the Lord and know that, you're, that, that, that your focus, it will be interrupted by the enemy until you overcome the enemy. What you focus on will beget itself and know that focus transforms and changes the energy and the atmosphere that you are in while revealing your true desires and you have the power to choose the focus that you operate in. What are you focusing on today? What redirect, <coughs> I want to know in your mind, what redirect do you need? Which one of these 10, I want to know, which one do you think is the easiest for you to be moving in? That's what I want to know. 
It's time that we get focused on the greater things of God because there will always be wars and rumors of wars. There will always be fussy people and there will always be stupid people. There just always will be. There will always be those things. Does it mean we need to focus on it? No, it does not. There will always be people that have yet to realize that certain clothing is a privilege and not a right. Doesn't mean we need to focus on it. So where are you? You got to get back to the basics. You got to get in the word, know the word, breathe the word, live the word, let the word absolve you. Let it just cover you. And I pray that as it does, that you experience a new move in the Lord because you need one. And you know you need one. And I'm not saying nothing you don't already know. You need this time with the Lord. You need a redirect. You need a shift in your family unit. And you need to start making time for what you say is important that has been slacking for far too long. We all do. It's time to clean house and redirect. And that's my message. So, Father, I thank you today for focus. I thank you, Father, that we can clear out the clutter, that we can move in a way where we are focused on you. Father, we thank you that you would say, think on these things, that we lift our minds up to you. Father, we lift <coughs> our brains to you. I pray today, Father, that your hand is upon us. We just, we just reject every single thing that the enemy would try to infiltrate us with today in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we just tear down and destroy every stronghold set up against us, and we take thought every, every thought captive unto you. We thank you, Father, that, that we're seeking first your kingdom. We thank you, Father, that you make our path straight, that, that as we focus on you, that you will be multiplied in our lives in every way, that everywhere we go, we will see you. And we thank you, Father, for moving in our lives in this new way today. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen and amen. And to God be the glory. And you know what? This is why we pray every day. Every day for going on seven years, we pray. Why? Because we all need a shift at the 2.30 in the morning hour, the 7 o'clock at night, the 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. We just pause. We, get a, we, we come together and we just breathe and we exhale and we praise the Lord and we enter in just for a moment to just pause. And I invite you to join us. Go to julieblairministries.org and you'll find right where, where it has worldwide daily prayer, global daily prayer. We are there. It gives you the access code for, for your nation. Dial the number and then log in. You're right there. You're with us. And stand in agreement with me. My, my, my prayer request is that we would have someone from every continent joining us all at one time. I just want that to happen before I die. That is what I want, a representative from every single continent. We've got Australia, we, we've got the UK, which I know is not a continent, but you get, we got someone from there. And I want Antarctica and all the others to be joining in with us. So, and of course, North America. So, that's my prayer request. Also at julieblairministries.org, there's a lot of blogs and resources and prayers that will help you to grow in the fullness of the Lord. So I pray that you are mightily blessed. I pray that you are focused and redirected on the things of the Lord and that you are walking in the fullness of the joy for all your days in Him. God bless you all. Know that you are being prayed for, that you are loved, and I just look forward to what the next message is that He has for us. God bless you. Till next time. Bye, everyone.